Hello there. Uh, hello there, everyone. Um, lovely to be back. Uh, over the last few weeks, I've been on holiday and the last weekend I went to see England versus Argentina at the Rugby World Cup. However, we are back again to talk about some of the big topics of the week. He's Ralph. I'm Peter. Let's do this. This week, we're going to talk about, firstly, UK recession fears. Secondly, China's slowdown. And thirdly, the impact on businesses affected by China's dominance. So first of all, um, to talk a bit, if we want to talk about um, the uh, slowdown in the UK. Um, now, the thing is, you haven't heard Ralph's voice for quite some time. So I think it is only fair that I let you let you speak um, so that you can um, you can you can you can fill the Ralph shaped hole that's been in your life for the last few weeks. So off you go, Ralph. <laughs> Hello, guys. This is my voice again. And that what you just heard was quote for I don't have a clue what's going on in the UK. So please, Ralph. Nice. Yeah enlighten us. Can I, can I just first of all say, um, before I say anything else, that the reason that we were on a three-week uh, sort of summer break has nothing to do with me at all. It was all Peter's fault, yeah. who, who ran off to Disneyland with his family, he claims, yeah. and then yeah. sort of ended up in, in, in France watching the yeah. ruckus, whereas yeah. I have been here yeah. on my chair at this desk, not yeah. moving away for three weeks because Amazing. this is the highlight of my day. Of and course it is. Now I'm back with you. It's awesome. It's all good. It's all good. And now I forgot what I was supposed to talk about. I think it was the UK. And Correct. In the UK, if you read some of the papers, I think the Independent said, shock slowdown. Mm. <laughs> and you think, well, it was 0.5%. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I know, of course, uh, we all know the economics here and we all know the power of data watching. But what happened is that analysts were widely expecting the economy to contract by 0.2%. And in the event, in the second quarter, it appears that it has contracted by 0.5%. And in terms of misses against expectations, that actually is a big deal. Um, the stock market, on the other hand, looking at the FTSE 100, well, I wouldn't exactly say they were taking it in their stride, this news, but if you actually look at it over the last month, they were, they, the stock market was slowly recovering. And then over the last four or five days, we had a sort of daily rally sustained over a period of about a week in, into this news. And the rally was halted. Yes, that is true. But we haven't actually seen any net negative impact from the news on stocks. That is not to say that the stock market hasn't reacted to it, but they certainly haven't panicked. And the reason why they haven't panicked might be that they are now, they now being analysts and commentators in the economy, are basically now expecting perhaps the interest rate increase cycle to either stop or be very close to its peak. I think people are still expecting the Bank of England at the next meeting to crank up interest rates by 25 bips. Bips, again, being the jargon word, that's 0.1 percent, pitch points. <laughs> um, and um, and then it should actually have come to to a close. Meaning, and I'm, I'm back in talking about inflation and interest rates. I know I wasn't supposed to it's, do, but of course, there all, it is. And if I get an in, then I'll take it. It's, it's all good. I mean, people haven't heard about this for the last few weeks. So I'm yeah. sure, you know, it will be like you talking about um, inflation will be like them uh, sort of slip, um, slipping on some comfortable slippers once once again i think you know. indeed i'm going to talk about it. sliders yeah sliders exactly. <laughs> Slide. 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 sliders in. yeah anyway go ahead just briefly so basically obviously it will be a very good news if inflation were well, it is coming down, but mm. we're, we're, um, how to phrase it? If expectation was becoming more solid, that inflation is going to be trending down, and that it is going to um, arrive by the year of, by by year end or by the first quarter next year, uh, within sort of the Bank of England uh, forecast, mm. um, which is two percent. 
And uh, that would, of course, be fantastic news for everybody. The interest rates coming down, less mortgage costs, we, we know the game. And I think that is sort of what the markets were sort of expecting there as well. Because if we get a contraction in the economy, yes, of course, that is not good in itself. But it might actually mean that also uh, the interest rate policy of the Bank of England is starting to work. Now, there we always have to distinguish. Is it a blip? Is it an underlying trend? And of course, there are blippy, that's a technical term, sort of uh, (laughs) exceptional elements to this, which has to do with um, strike action Mm. and which has to do with what what the economists call an externality, which is sort of a cost that wouldn't arise in the normal course of doing business, that sort of thing. In this particular case, we know also what that is. These are various activists, demonstrations, um, stopping traffic, to um, what are these guys called again? Um, e- Extinction Rebellion. Mm-hmm. And, and the more frequently such action happens, obviously it has the same effect as strike action. And the economists are saying that had an impact on the contraction of the economy we're seeing. Mm-hmm. So we, we'll have to see. I mean, if we are sliding, sliding again into technical recession, which really only means that we have two consecutive quarters of negative growth, and yes, again, we can laugh at this. Negative growth means contraction; doesn't mean growth yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then, <laughs> then, then we have a recession. Is that going to be a disaster? Probably not, uh, because Germany is technically or has been technically in recession already. For example, I mean, this is just something which we have to take into account. It's just going to happen as a result of the situation we're in. Um, why would it be negative? It would be negative for the political parties, well, for, for one political party, for the Tory mm. party, because we're heading into election cycle next year, and uh, they will, of course, want to avoid any negative news. So in conclusion, I would say, yes, the news looked at at the headline level is clearly negative, mm. but I think the underlying silver lining that we might get to the end of the interest rate hikes and the, and, and the commensurate, uh, what's the word here, established trend downwards for inflation and all the positive impacts which are going to be connected with that is probably uh, taking um, taking the balance here. And, 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 and at the moment, we're coming, we're coming out as a net moderately negative from this news i think but but now, not I, but, but but not like the independent try to suggest a shock disaster yeah no fair enough i mean the thing is we ca- we we came pretty close uh within it was something like 0.1 or something of of, of recession i yes. think it was at the end of last year mm. and you know there was there was much made of the fact that we didn't fall into recession although it was by literally half a whisker um i would say that um you know the expectation now is again that we will fall into to recession um as you mentioned you know this will be problematic for uh for the conservative party um heading into election year next year um i think personally that the only way that we can avoid recession that we might re- avoid recession is if somehow um the government brings in measures that will suddenly you know at least paper over the cracks um and provide some kind of growth now i don't know how they're going to do that um but maybe they will because to fall into recession especially next year um would be an absolute gift um, to the Labour Party in particular. Um, so, you know, I, that's yeah, all I would say is maybe, you know, will the government just pull out all the stops to, to prevent uh, us falling into recession? I don't know. But that's the only way I think we can get out of it as things stand at the moment. So anyway, let's move on to the, to the next thing is a China slowdown. Now, I mean, this is, this is a very much of a I guess it's a general thing. I mean, a lot of the data points that we've been seeing over the past few weeks and months are that China is slowing down. You know, we've had that uh, news, was it recently, that was saying that 
the um, Chinese um, wanted to, uh, the government was telling observers, um, you know, like economists and things, not to um, uh, dwell on the negative. Um, also, it stopped giving out figures of youth unemployment because they're so high. Um, you know, all that kind of thing. Obviously, they are trying to control the narrative. They are trying to do uh, damage, damage limitation. Uh, but we also saw this week, though, that there was a, a business confidence problem. Um, so the most recent Kaishin um, survey showed that the uh, business confidence in August fell to its lowest point in a year. Um, which isn't great. That's bad for job creation, wealth creation. Um, it also arguably stops innovators from innovating because they feel that they don't want to take on so much risk. Although, obviously, the state is trying to encourage um, banks to lend. Um, but, you know, but it just seems um, that at the moment uh, the confidence is low. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you think about that, Ralph? Entirely true. I mean, obviously, these are the data. Um, I, I don't really have a lot to add to the data. Confidence appears to be low at the moment and mm. growth is certainly stalling. M maybe just um, less as an opinion piece from me, more maybe just a little bit of framework of where the Chinese economy stands in the mm. world and where it comes from and what we are actually looking at here. Mm. Because it is a phenomenal uh, um, country, I have, I have to say, when obviously it came out of nowhere, out of uh, the, the Mao Zedong uh, revolution there, which created a bitterly poor country with uh, a very poorly applied form of communism, which happens to be sort of generally the case when communism has been tried to apply in, in, in reality as a functioning uh, system to organize societies it, it has always been back it has always backfired and countries were always bitterly poor so that was china then and then uh, with the advent of uh, other um, politburos and of course notably xi jinping um, they injected I'm, I'm going to call this free market economy for now principles into their otherwise still um, <clears throat> state state communism uh, led system and that has been the engine for the growth we've been seeing so that was the masterstroke the actual statistics which we have then been encountering of growth something like 20 25 percent a year now they are very from this very low base and and Nobody please misunderstand me. That does not mean that this is not a very notable achievement indeed, but we cannot compare these growth rates with those which we encounter in, in, in the free world where free market economies have been established for a lot longer. Uh, the, 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 the second point I'd like to make is that China has now grown to be the second largest economy in the world by GDP, but it is not the second largest by means of GDP per capita. Uh, GDP per capita is only number 76 in the world. So there is a stark difference between GDP in general, number two, and GDP per capita, uh, which you can sort of see as a measure of what actually trickles down to the average person in the street, and that is number 76. Now, in other words, and everybody knows this, of course, I'm just uh, saying things which everybody has it, has heard before just to focus our minds on it it means that the chinese eco economic miracle is not equally spread out equally shared with the entire population in china mm -hmm. and and just to give you some numbers on this which i looked up earlier uh, if, if you look at the total wealth that means household wealth this is not gdp household wealth um in various regions in the world, and I'm only going to mention three, so North America, which is the US and Canada, is around 100 trillion US dollars in total wealth. Europe is about 85 bill, uh, trillion dollars. And uh, China is about, and I'm going to read this out so that I don't get this wrong, is about 52, 52 trillion. So that's not nothing, but it is, of course, much less than you find in North America. 
Now, North America, maybe 400 million people live there. China, 1.2 billion live there. And yet the total household wealth, as you add it all up, is half of that of North America. So you, you, you're finding again this, this measure of GDP per capita there. And you can read this in two ways. I mean, once you can say, well, this clearly means that there are only some regions in China and some sectors which actually produce anything massively. Um, and the rest of them is the, the rest of China is basically nowhere. But that's probably the wrong way of reading it. The right way of reading is 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 that this country still has vast potential to 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 develop these currently underdeveloped regions in its country in the future. And that is exactly what Xi Jinping is trying to do. So for 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 him to be able to do that, however, he needs to foster investment in China. And that is another sort of Achilles heel in the Chinese economy has always been, because investments have been driven, are driven by state-owned uh, companies. The, the sole purpose of them is to actually do just that, to invest in particular sectors. And this has always been done by cheap credit subsidized by the government. And then you get to this sort of um, bust and boom cycle. So cheap credit fuels investment, prices go up, people can't afford the goods anymore. And, and, and that has been um, the history of the Chinese economy pretty much over the last 60 years or so. And you can actually really see that these coincide with the five-year plans which are, being, which are being done. So the reason why I mentioned this and the reason why I think this may be important to us is um, because currently with interest rates being where they are and <laughs> I'll say it again and inflation being where they are this time I'm talking about China though I'm not going to repeat everything again yeah. uh, don't worry uh, <laughs> the, the China can't really afford to do that so its own tried and tested investment policy which drives and has driven to a marked extent the growth which we have seen is currently in itself weakening and that is I think the reason why we are seeing this this this, this stalling of growth. Mm. And and so I'm, I'm going to stop here. This is more of perhaps, well, I hope it is of general interest. It is not really an opinion which I have to offer on where China is going to go, but I hope it helps a little bit to put China and the economic dynamics which we encounter there into some framework and, and, and see uh, why it is currently slowing down. I think that is one of the most important reasons behind it. Yeah. But also, of course, where China is A, possibly has the potential to go in future, and B, this is more important, will want to go in future. Because Xi Jinping has, of course, also said, I think, recently, Again, what what is it? What does he call this again? Um, common prosperity. prosperity. That's it. it. It's the common prosperity. Um, generic handle which he wants to put on the on the economy. And I said earlier, this is not a country which shares out its wealth equally um, uh, amongst the population. And he wants to get back to that. And so part of his plan is to develop the regions in China which are currently underdeveloped, which actually almost 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 satirically is almost every region. Most of the remarkable economic manufacturing capacity which China has comes from regions which are the coastal regions. Most of the rest is um, not as well developed. And so that is where we are. And obviously, that is where China will want to go. And that creates, um, unfortunately, a threat to the free world because it is bound up with China's political hegemonial ambitions in the Southeast Asia Sea, notably also Taiwan, and I'm sure that's what we are going to discuss at some point again. We are. We are indeed. So there we go. So yeah, I mean, I think this is a, this is one of those sort of ongoing themes. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the moment, um, China has been slowing down and it's had an effect um, all around the world. I mean, the uh, you know, demand generally for commodities 
has been has been down because generally speaking china i believe is the biggest or if not one of the biggest yes. the biggest importer of commodities in the world so when china slows down everyone feels it so um so yeah but anyway um so there we go so that that's that point so we'll go uh, to the final point um which is looking at really um uh, uh, industries businesses industries that have been affected by china's dominance so um first of all to start with the uh automotive industry so it was very interesting um ft article again um which is saying that uh, china is now on track to become the world's biggest car exporter this year this year so it will overtake japan um and that's according to uh you know data from moody's um and i think that you know that they've been particularly uh successful with electric vehicles mm-hmm. now coupled with that we then saw um uh you know uh, this week um that the eu has now decided um to uh to do an investigation um into um into uh subsidies and the unfairness thereof of state china's state subsidies giving chinese auto, uh, ev makers an unfair advantage versus their competitors so um so that came out this week that's kind that is a bit of a shocker because of course <laughs> if it does if you follow this through if they find that um that chinese ev manufacturers have received excessive profits uh sorry excessive um help and in the form of subsidies from the government then they are going to put tariffs on um on chinese import or car chinese car imports Mm -hmm. now that could be 10 15 percent who knows but um the chinese are very quick to come back and say no, um, you know, this isn't fair. You're targeting us. Um, this is going to um, adversely affect um, relations with China and we are going to fight back, by which I presume it means that they are just going to slap taxes, uh, you know, similar taxes or more um, on, say, European uh, car manufacturers. Now, that is going to be very painful. I think because you've got companies like VW and um, BMW um, who are very serious operations in China and get a, a big chunk of their revenues from China. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean this is a this is a, a you know this is a major thing. This could escalate if if tariffs are involved, um, and yeah, it's a, it's a serious situation. So, what, what do you think, Ralph? Well, I, I, I hate this situation. It's a completely farcical situation if you think about it, because uh, none of this would really be, and I'm going to put this into air quotes, necessary mm. if China had less political risk to carry. Mm. We, we are always dancing around this uh, possibility that China might actually invade Taiwan with the cataclysmic consequences that would have for the free world. Mostly, and I'm just going to mention this in parentheses, we're not talking about this today, but mostly or also because Taiwan um, is smack in the middle of one of the most important sea trade routes uh, between the, 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 the Western and the Eastern uh, Hemisphere. That's why Taiwan, it's one of the reasons why Taiwan is so important. And clearly, uh, a Chinese emboldening hegemonial force as a emerging leader of a consolidating autocratic world is something which of course the free world would also be concerned about and these concerns are we we, we can't int- disentangle the, the, the it's, it's like a Gordian knot. We can't cut it. You know, you you can't say, oh, but this is politics. Let's let's take this out of business. We were doing business here. You know, this is we business people. But uh, we were c- clearly we may be, but this is uh, not going to be uh, a pol- policy politics free zone when it comes to dealing with China. So that is obvious. Uh, I just wanted to mention this first. Um, 
The second point is the EU probe. Well, I, I would almost say I'm bemused by this, but I'm actually more than bemused. I, I find it rather ridiculous for the EU to say, ooh, uh, this, this is an unfair advantage. This is not fair or unfair. I mean, this is it's in in their good rights to actually subsidize whatever industry they want. It's their industry, you know. So this goes back to what I said earlier in my sort of generic spiel about what the Chinese economy is and how it works. In in investments are state subsidized in China. This is the way they're doing business in China, and so cheap credit, for example, to fuel investments uh, is a, a tried and tested component of Chinese business policy. And the EU needs to, of course, find some reason to justify tariffs which it wants to slap on uh, Chinese cars. But to me, this is fair and complete. They, they, they want to do this anyway. They just need to find the reason so that they can say, oh, this is unfair, therefore we do this. Um, the reason why the EU wishes to do this is obvious because, as you say, China has emerged as, or is emerging today, sorry, this year, as the most um, important automotive industry in the world. And to be honest with you, it's all, always been dancing around that first spot anyway in the last mm -hmm. sort of 10 years, to be, to yeah. be honest. Um, and, so, and so what we're getting to here is a situation that the EU and of course also America it believes that it needs to protect the, its, its own sectors through protective tariffs probably for the reason which I mentioned before, because of politics. If China was a friendly country, which did not actually carry the political risk which we defined earlier, none of that would be necessary. You, you would just then say, well, we may not like it, but the cars are good. If we mm. want to keep them out of our country, let's make better cars. Mm. But that's not how this is going to work this time. And, um, and so I do see various risks here not just in the automotive industry that that we are going we being the eu i know we we are not part of the eu anymore let, let, let's say europe that sort of europe and of course the european union is going to follow the us in in into a trade war with china which will have political implications as well and is not going to benefit anybody not china not the eu um and uh, is not going to benefit uh the much needed decrease of inflation Mm. There, yeah. I said it again. Yeah, I just can't, was, can't, can't, that was shoehorned in a bit. Absolutely but, brilliant. No, but anyway, jo but jo jo joking aside, that that's the, the the situation that I foresee. the The only way out of this, well, not the only way, but one possible way out of this would sort of be that uh, European manufacturers and US manufacturers would sort of have to do what I just said: leave politics aside and say, well, we just need to manufacture better cars, or in this particular case specifically, we need to find ways to manufacture batteries ourselves, maybe maybe accelerating the vast resources of whatever that was exactly, the, the metal which is used in the manufacturing of Norway, which has recently been found in Norway, for example, mm -hmm. or the announcement of Toyota that by 2028 they will deliver solid state batteries. All these types of advances will have to be harnessed and perhaps uh, focused into developing an industry which is less dependent on the input of China in order to then also garner political capital out of that. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you know, that's that, that, Yes, absolutely. And, and when you think that at the moment, uh, Chinese EVs have got uh, an eight percent market share in Europe, and that projections are that they, they that will go up to fifteen percent in two years. You know, time uh, time appears to be of the essence. Now, 
I have said, like I said last week, um, my controversial ranting opinion um, last week, that I personally believe that we have lost, uh, everyone has lost uh, the EV battle with China. Uh, that's not defeatist. That's just how it is. Um, they've got, you know, 90%, they've got control of 90% or, or more of the world's raw materials and refining um, for batteries. They've got the biggest battery manufacturer in the world cat uh, in cattle. Um, they've got, uh, and then all of their, um, their EV makers are doing incredibly well in the domestic market and they're wanting to do well abroad. Hmm. So, you know, I personally believe that what needs to be done here is we need to sort of acknowledge um, China's superiority here and then put all our, or, you know, put suddenly put a lot more effort and money into alternative, as you say, technologies that that mean that we are less dependent um, on on, you know, on China. That's going to take a while, but. I think that it needs to be done. Otherwise, we'll be in the same position that we were when, um, for instance, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, um, we that, uh, you know, Europe did have capacity with regard to solar panels, but then just China completely obliterated um, the whole market. So that is going to happen again. And it's ridiculous because if we've seen it already happen, Mm -hmm. why are we letting it happen all over again? Uh, well, I, I, indeed. I mean, I think it's I think it's arrogance on on the part of the the companies involved because they clearly thought, oh well, ch- not treated China seriously enough, but now they should. And you know, we need to sort something out here. Not saying I'm not against China. I'm just saying that if we want to actually compete with China, we've got to do something drastic. And yeah. that drastic action is, you know, going to you know hydrogen fuel cells. Um, synthetic fuels, you know, that sort of thing. Well, in, indeed, I, I, I just feel as if we are, well, we too as well, but uh, we as, 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 as the free world perhaps are discovering this maybe slightly late. And it, it, it wasn't exactly a mystery, was it? I mean, the automotive no. industry, we were, we were just singling this one out now for mm. the chat. Uh, the automotive industry has been a, a stellar success in 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 China, mm. and it has been, and, and not just since yesterday. That's been going on for the last ten years, mm. uh, maybe fifteen. Let, let's let's say ten solid years, mm. definitely. And so where we are now is, you see, if you if you, if you follow me uh, just uh, for for a moment into my thoughts here, I know from the point of view of an economist this may sound slightly naive, but if if you think about this like this. Okay, we don't like Chinese cars because we're worried about our own, so we're going to slap tariffs on them. Uh, that will make them more expensive, and we're hoping that people are going to buy our cars instead. Um, that that will always backfire, by the way, for the very reasons which you mentioned, because China will then do the same and reciprocate, and then trade trade comes to a halt, and that's not good. So if I wish to actually protect my economy and make sure that more domestic cars are being bought than foreign cars, what I can also do, in, I, 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 can, I can lower the price for my own cars. If you think about it, that will have the same effect because then will people buy my cars rather than the other ones, which are then also more expensive. It's, it's the same effect as tariffs. But of course, it's naive because you can't do it. You, you can't just simply lower the price because clearly the price is the price for a reason. And it's not it's not because evil industrialists want to line the pockets. It's because they the profit margins are calculated uh, so that you get an optimized sale given the costs which you incur. Um, so everybody knows that. So we can't do that. But what can we do to get an equivalent incentive? We can't lower the price, but we can increase the quality of the product for the same price over the in, over the quality of the product but that we can buy abroad. And I know that sounds very much theoretical, but it sort of chimes exactly with what you said. This is technological progress and technological advancement. And unfortunately, that also will have needed to start a good 10 years ago. And in you know, in, in, in pockets, is, it of course has. But I do wonder whether we are, we, whether we're putting our, 
um, money on the on on the wrong horse. Uh, hydrogen mm -hmm. is also something which I think we would need to actually look at and fuel some more investments into. But if we're staying with electric vehicles, I think we need to um, accelerate and focus on the opportunities that we do have. And I mentioned them before. Norway mm -hmm. is one, mm -hmm. which is the raw material found there and uh, Toyota's solid state batteries is another one fusion technology to create the electricity for the EV batteries is a third one etc but it is going to be a tough um, a tough uh, the time ahead I'm, I'm afraid in terms yeah. of the global economy it is <laughs> so uh, we shall just quickly finish on um... Another example um, of this where where a China is asserting its dominance, um, there is a company called Beko. In fact, I've got a Beko washing machine mm -hmm. um, and Beko is, uh, a, a, you know, is part of a stable of brands, including Grundig, Blomberg, not Bloomberg, Blomberg and Singer. Um, and the parent company is... Uh, it, I, I forgive my pronunciation here. The um, spelling is A R C E L I K, uh, Say which it. sounds arsenic, maybe. Um, and I, I'm hoping that the closed captions that might appear on this video will uh, reflect something. I don't know, but anyway. Uh, and interestingly, uh, fun fact that the parent company of that company uh, is called K O C or is spelt KOC holding, uh, which what a, you know, what a coincidence. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the, the whole kind of argument with that is that, um, is, is that, um, they have made, so China's, um, appliance makers have, have made too many products, too much product. And the, and what Beko is, or what, what actually Arslik is saying is that they are saying that um, what will happen is that this excess product is going to find its way to Europe, be sold cheaply, mm. and that's going to mean that people aren't buying Beko or Grundig or Blomberg uh, machines. Mm. They're going to buy Chinese machines instead. Now, this has happened many times before where, let's say, particularly iron ore is, one, is a classic example where China has made too much and so they think, well, we, we've got all the stuff we need. Let's just flood the market. And that means that everyone outside China suffers because no one can undercut the Chinese because the Chinese just want to get rid of this mm. excess. Mm -hmm. So this is a real problem. Um, and, you know, and, and I think, you know, if you're an appliance maker, it's not great. Because, of course, you don't buy many appliances during, during, you know, you buy an appliance and you keep it for many years. So this sure. is a... You know, this is a serious problem um, and, again, goes to show how, you know, China, China's dominance in manufacturing is kind of, you know, is an, is, this is another area, not just cars, but in other areas where it can provide ch goods cheaply. And the fact of the matter is we're in a cost of living crisis. People are much more cost conscious than they perhaps would be in the past. So even if they've been slightly reticent about maybe buying a Chinese EV or a Chinese washing machine, um, they're going to think, well, they're way cheaper. I'm going to go with the cheap, you know, I'm going to go with the cheap one and hope everything's OK because it, you know, I can't afford the other one. So yeah. it's another example. Absolutely. Um, well, I can't add anything to that. So the only thing which I would like to say is that I do hope that we get the pronunciation of the companies in question wrong. And I yes. have some evidence for that because you said Grundig. Now, on that one, I can tell ah, sorry, you that yes. as a German, it's called Grundig. So I have ah, some Grundig. hope. Yes. I have some hope that we are not pronouncing this properly. But I can say this, and this is the thought I would like to leave you guys with. If I had to cover cover as in I used to be an equity analyst of course you guys know this so if I if, if, if some of my companies which I had to cover would be called things like every Brit would pronounce as Arslik owned by Cockholding 
there would be an explosion of juvenile giggling every yes. time I would enter the morning meeting. And I, for one, would not know why, because I no. really don't have any issue with this. And I no. find it, quite frankly, despicable when yes, people yes. snigger about yes. and this immature. type of thing. Immature. immature. They're just yes. names, guys. Yes. They're just for, names. For, um, I mean, thankfully... You see me? You, I mean, I'm not laughing yeah. no. at all. I mean, thankfully... Both you and I are, you know, mature adults. Correct. And we can we can power through. Yes. You know, it's good. Flaps yeah. and flaps. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So I uh, lost it. on on that note, um, I think oh we shall leave it there. Um, thank you so much. I've I've missed you, Ralph. I've you missed you, Ralph. Missed it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I've, I've I've missed everyone else. As I can feel. I can feel the I can the feel vibes. Every, the vibes, the vibes, the goodwill. Yes, exactly. So thank you very much indeed. Um, it was a lot of fun, as always, and um, we'll see you again soon. Absolutely, guys. Thanks for listening. Many thanks. Cool. Bye.